Well, if you have a Bible, open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12 is where we're going to be today. And uh, today we are wrapping up our series, Challenged Values. So we've been looking over the last five weeks at our five core values here at Kernan, uh, one by one. And so we've taken some time to really dissect these and talk about them, and especially to really answer the question, how can we stay true to our values as a church in the face of different challenges that may come our way. And so really these values serve as guardrails for us as we pursue the vision we believe God has given us. And so uh, if you haven't heard our, our vision sermon, I preached that back on January 7th. That's a vision statement that we adopted back in 2020. And so we're four years into that now. Um, but you can go back on our podcast or on our YouTube channel or the website and, uh, and listen or watch that sermon. But but these guardrails are really, uh, they, these core values, I should say, serve as guardrails that are going to keep us focused on that and really centered, right? Centered on the path, centered on the road, if you will, as we pursue what we believe God has given us to pursue. And so today, uh, we are looking at our fifth and final core value. We believe Membership is essential to one's commitment to the church. So I want to pray for us and ask the Lord to help us understand this today. uh, And then we're going to just dive right in. All right. So let's pray and ask God to help us as we pursue this. Jesus, we love you. We thank you again, Lord, for just being able to celebrate today the baptism with Daisy, Lord, and just being able to worship you, being able to hear the word of God, Lord. So we ask now that you would focus our hearts and our minds. Lord, that we would not entertain any other thought unless it pertains to worshiping and wondering and marveling at who you are. So so Lord, would you give us grace? Give us grace and help us to understand exactly what we need to know about committing to your people, to your body, especially as it is written in 1 Corinthians 12. Give us wisdom here, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So this final core value is derived exactly from 1 Corinthians 12, where the Apostle Paul is telling us something very significant about the church. So would you look with me on the screens or in your Bible, in, the, in, the, in your chair? 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 through 14. Here's what Paul says to the church in the ancient city of Corinth. He says, for just as the body is one... And has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, all. And all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. And then jumping down to verse 27, Paul says this. He says, now you, you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So I want us to talk today really about three things. Three things we can see from this today in relation to our fifth core value as a church. So I want us to look and see what the church is, why we must commit to it, and how. So what the church is, why we must commit to it, and how we can commit to it. So number one, let's talk about what exactly is the church? Well, if you're looking for just a good, simple definition of of what the church is, you could say this, the church is the people of God who have been saved through repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So let let me repeat that again. The church is the people of God who have been saved through repentance and faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this kind of exists on two scales, all right? So there's a universal aspect to this. So in other words, you could talk about the church that includes all believers at all points in history all around the world, right? So when we say the church, when we say that one day the church will be united with Christ in heaven forever, we're talking about all believers 
who have ever lived at any point in history who committed their lives to Jesus Christ all around the world. So we would say that's the universal church, right? We all belong to that if we follow Christ. But the greater church, the universal church, manifests itself in different and separate local congregations, right? So a local church, such as the one you're sitting in, is a community of believers in a particular place and a particular context with a particular mission who confess Jesus Christ as Lord, all right? So the Bible the Bible talks a lot, actually. In the New Testament, we see a lot of language and instruction about what the church is. So it uses several metaphors or images to describe a church. So one, as we see here in 1 Corinthians 12, uh, 12, is Paul saying that the church is like a body, right? It's like a human physical body. Look again what he says in verse 12. He says, for just as the body, talking about your physical body, is one and has many members, right? So you have eyes and ears and a nose and hands and feet, right? So all the members of your body, though, even though you have a lot of different body parts, they're all one body, right? And he's saying the same thing is true with the body of Christ. In other words, the church, right? We look around the room. We see we see all of us here together. We all come from different backgrounds. We all have different, we're all in different seasons of life, right? But though we are many, though we are different, we are all one, Paul says, with Christ. He says, verse 27, you, you church are the body. He's the head. Jesus is the head. He's the leader. He is the great shepherd, but we are the body. And individually, Paul says, we're members of it. So that's just one metaphor. And that's the one we're focusing mostly on today. The Bible gives other metaphors. The Bible speaks of the church as being a family, right? So by faith in Christ, we are adopted by God the Father, into his family. So now you, if you have trusted Jesus to be your Savior, you have a seat at the table of God forever. You're not an orphan. You are not estranged. No, you are a part of the family forever. The Bible also describes the church as the bride of Christ. If Jesus, if Jesus is the groom, right, then we are the bride. And one day, with the marriage supper of the Lamb, we will be united with Christ in heaven forever. The church describes, or I'm sorry, the Bible describes the church as a building. God is building each of us as living stones. He is creating something. He is building something. He is making something by renewing people, by bringing people to salvation and redeeming their lives. He's building something far better than we could ever build ourselves. So by looking closer at these metaphors and these images and their respective contexts in the New Testament, what you begin to see is a very significant truth emerging here. When we talk about what the church is, the first thing we have to understand is that the church is a creation of God himself. The church is a creation of God. The church is not a man-made organization. Now, I think that our default Mindset is sometimes to think of the church as something that humans invented, right? That people invented. And, and, you know, hey, listen, maybe that's somewhat understandable because we come here and we sit in a physical building that humans built, right? We sit in a physical building that people built. And so we see human beings all around us, right? I mean, there's no robots in here that I'm aware of, right? So here we are, right? We're all here, right? But what we don't see right? What we don't see is Jesus and his physical body present here in this room right now with us. And so are we tempted to think that this is just a human doing, right? That this is man-made? Well, maybe we are. But though we don't see Jesus in the room, is his spirit here? His spirit is here because guess what? This is not our doing. We didn't make this. We didn't build this. The church was created by Jesus. Jesus instituted the church. Jesus brought the church to formation. Jesus empowered the church through his spirit. It completely belongs to him. In Ephesians 5.25, Paul is relating this to a marriage, but, but I want to actually focus on what he says at the end of that verse. He says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
So Jesus loved the church so much that he gave his life for it. Because why? Because the church is people. The church is people. Jesus did not die for our building. Jesus did not die for our programs, as great as they may be. Jesus died for people. Jesus gave up his life, his life, so that we could find true life, eternal life. By repenting of our sin and our rebellion against him, by turning to him for for our salvation and, and following him all of our days with other believers in what Jesus created, the church. So the church, the church is a creation of people. That's what it is, right? It's not, it's not just, like I said, it's not a building. It's not an organization like other great nonprofit organizations out there that we love, many of which we support, right? But no, it's not that. The church is people. And so what is God doing? He's really creating a new humanity. When he saves you, when he opens your eyes and gives your heart the gift of faith in his name, He is pulling you out of the depths of your sin. He is pulling you out of that dark pit of your own lostness. And he's making you a new person. He's giving you a new name. He's giving you a seat at the table forever. You see, the church is a creation of new people. You see that? That's why Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this, all this is from God, not from us, from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself. You see, Jesus came into this world and changed it forever through self-sacrifice in our place for us. So after Jesus does this, he he does this in the first century, He, he sacrifices his own life so that he can create a new humanity, a new people who will one day live in a new earth that he completely renews and redeems where everything is made right, where all sad things become untrue. Jesus does this, and then he leaves the earth, which is somewhat surprising, we may think, especially at first reading of the Gospels, of the biographies of Jesus. You're reading that he has done this wonderful thing that he gave up his life, that he rose from the grave, and then he leaves the earth. But what does he do? He ascends into heaven and sends the Holy Spirit. He sends the Holy Spirit of God to come and empower the first Christians. And what happens? The church is born. It's a movement of God that Jesus now has delegated to his people through the power of his spirit. The church is not just a creation of God. It comes from him. It is a continual movement of God. Look at Acts chapter 2. This is just a beautiful depiction. You can read this on, your screen, on the screens. This is just a beautiful snapshot of the first Christians. I'm talking about the first Christians, like literally living in the ancient city of Jerusalem after Jesus rose from the grave and he sends the Holy Spirit to dwell inside all people who trust in his name, to live inside of them, to transform their ways of thinking, to make them new people, new creations, as Paul said. And when that happens to you, how could you ever be the same, right? You're still gonna have daily struggles with sin. You're still gonna have daily patterns of thoughts and actions that you don't want and you don't like. But ultimately, you're leading, you're being led by the Holy Spirit and you're following Jesus, And so you see progression over time. And and what happened in Acts chapter 2 is a snapshot of when that first started happening and people's lives were being changed. And look at how they lived. In verse 42, and they devoted themselves, so the church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts 
praising God and having favor with all the people. And what happened? And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. It was remarkable what was happening. People were starting to take notice. When the first Christians were so changed and so moved by the Holy Spirit of God living inside of them, they started living radically different lives. Instead of clinging to things to promote themselves, they started letting go of things to help others. They started living radically unselfish. And we read this and we think, wow, if only we could see revival in the church like that. If only we could see that happen in today's world. But let me ask you, what did these early Christians have that we don't have? What did they have that we don't have? Do we have Jesus as our Savior? Yes. Do we have God as our Father? Do we have the Holy Spirit living in us? Yes and yes and yes. We must understand we are a part of the same movement. It's still going on. If you follow Jesus Christ, if you've given your life to Him, you are a part of the exact same thing that started 2,000 years ago. What started in the first century with this first group of small Christians has continued. And it spread over the centuries. It, It continued to spread This message of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, coming to earth as one of us, putting himself in our place to do what we could never do, raising from the grave because he is God and he has the power over sin and death. This message of good news that you can have a relationship with God. You can be made right with him. You can live with him forever. This good news started to spread up into Europe, started to spread out into Asia, into Africa, And over the centuries and over the time and and, and explorers start exploring the new world and here we are, right? This message spread all the way around the world even to here, to right now, to this moment and this time in history on Kernan Boulevard in Jacksonville, Florida. It's here. Same movement. Same message. See, this church, Kernan Church, is being part of this movement, this universal church as a whole. We are a movement of God created by God and for his glory. So if we're ever going to embody the truth of 1 Corinthians 12 that Paul's talking about, being the body of Christ, we must understand what we are actually a part of. It's bigger and better than any one person. The church is bigger and better than anything we could ever have dreamt up on our own. We are the body. Of Christ. How great is that? So why should we commit to this? That brings us to our second point, why we must commit to the church. See, when we talk about committing to the church, we're not talking about committing to just an idea or an abstract philosophy, right? Or a feel-good scenario. We're not committing to an experiment, I don't know if this is going to work, right? We're not committing to, and like I've said already, we're not committing to a man-made institution, right? We're not committing to a chili cook-off and cornhole tournament, as great as it was, right? It was wonderful, and I loved it. But what are we actually committing to here? We're committing to a Savior. You see that? That's what you're committing to. That's what I'm committing to. We're committing to a Savior, to a Savior and His bride, His body to whom by faith we now belong ourselves now someone may argue well listen you know Jesus isn't the problem it's the church I don't like or I just don't like organized religion right you'll hear that you'll hear people say these things but I I really think that's kind of like going up to your friend and saying hey man you know I really like you but I don't like your wife That's insulting, right? It may be true, okay? I don't know, right? You and your friend, y'all need to talk about this and work it out, right? But it's insulting not just to the wife, 
It's also insulting to the husband, right? Think of it this way. If you were a Christian, but, but you, for whatever reason, just don't, you just don't really commit to the body, to the bride of Christ. You just don't really commit to a local church. And so you try to you kind of live this, this rogue version of Christianity kind of on your own, right? That's, that would be kind of like a, a person calling themselves a football player. And everywhere they go around Jacksonville, they just wear, they wear a football jersey and they carry a football with them, right? Into Target, into Starbucks, into Publix. This is what they do, right? This is a grown man pretending he's on a football team, right? Now, he is going to go up to you and say, hey, I'm a football player, right? And you may say, well, okay, right? That's good. That's good for you. You're a football player. Where's your team? Well, I don't, I don't play on a team. I don't, I don't go to the practices, right? I don't, I don't play, I don't go to the games, right? I don't, I don't really show up, you know, I don't have to practice. I don't have to do any of that, right? This, I'm actually describing an offensive lineman from this past season over the Jaguars. That's what I'm, uh, just kidding. <laughs> but do you see how that just doesn't make sense? Oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, what church do you go to? Well, you know, I mean, I, I'm not really in the church as much. I don't really like the whole man-made organization stuff, you know. But I mean, I'm okay with Jesus. And I do want to be, on a serious note, listen, I do want to be sensitive to people who have had previous bad church experiences for whatever reasons. Yes, some people have had really poor and and terrible experiences at previous churches. Maybe you have been hurt. right? Maybe you have been hurt in a previous bad church experience for ungodly reasons, for things that should not have happened. But at the same time, on the other hand, we have to acknowledge there is no perfect church that doesn't excuse sin. But when we're thinking of more trivial things, there is no perfect church. Because guess what? Churches are made up of sinful people. I hate to break it to you, but your pastor, me, I'm sinful. You may, I, did you know this? <laughs> right? But so are you. <laughs> so are you. We are sinful people. We're redeemed by grace. And we're on a trajectory of sanctification, but we are still in our nature. We are sinful people. But if that is you, I want to encourage you that you can't look. You can't look at one bad experience at a previous church and say, well, I'm just done with all churches. I'm never going back to any kind of church again. Listen, that's like saying you had a bad experience at one restaurant. Well, I'm never going to eat at any restaurants ever again, right? I'm just going to make food at home forever, right? I'm never going to go into another restaurant. Now, I totally get it you know, excommunicating one restaurant, right? The, the particular one where you had a bad experience, you know, you woke up with food poison, like, I ain't doing that again. Get it, right? But nobody in their right mind would ever say, well, I'm never going to go to any other restaurant ever again, right? But if we're ever going to make sense of this, if we're ever really going to understand in our minds why we must commit to a local church, we have to keep coming back to the truth of what the church actually is. It is a creation and movement of God. Jesus loves the church. You know why Jesus loves the church? Because Jesus loves you. That's why he loves the church, because Jesus loves you. He died for you. He died for his people. If Jesus loves his church that much, then why would we disagree with him about it, right? Now listen, I'm not saying you have to be BFF with everybody in here, okay? That's not possible. I get it, right? We have our own few, you know, we have some crazy uncles and, you know, I'm, you know we, we're a family, right? <laughs> but if Jesus loves his church that much, why would we put ourselves at odds against the way he feels about us? Have you ever thought of it that way? Jesus is committed to you. Jesus is not going to turn his back on you. Jesus is faithful to you to the end. So why would we disagree with him about our fellow believers, right? Is the church made up of messed up people? Yes. Are we all broken and flawed? Yes. Do we all make mistakes? Absolutely. But that's exactly the point. We're not claiming to be perfect as a church, but you know what? We are claiming that we know someone who is perfect. That's what we're claiming. And he has asked us 
to give all of ourselves to him. He has asked us to give all of ourselves to his people, to his body, to his bride, to his family, to what he is building. Jesus said it this way in John 13. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's the way the world will know. If the outside world who hates organized religion, if the outside world who hates the idea of Jesus being the exclusive savior of the world, if the outside world in this secular mindset or atheistic mindset, if they can look at a community of Christ followers and see us loving one another, it will speak. That is witness. That is witness. So why? Why must we commit to God's church? Because we want to commit to Him. We want to publicly worship God. We want to give Him the honor He deserves. Because we need other believers to help us do this, to walk alongside us on this spiritual journey that we're all on. Because we want to equip ourselves to be faithful witnesses in this world for Christ, we need each other to do that. That's what our vision statement articulates here at Kernan. That's why it says what it does. Straight out of the New Testament, Kernan exists to glorify God by making disciples who worship with authenticity, walk in community, and witness as we go out into this world and live our lives. If we've committed to Christ, if you have committed to Jesus Christ, you'll be committed to his people. You really, you you just really can't have one without the other. We have to commit to Christ and his body. There's just no good excuse to not be that way. Number three, how can we do this? How can we commit to Christ's Body, his family, his bride, his building. How can we commit to the church? Look what Paul says in Ephesians 4. He says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, right? Christ is the head of the church into Christ. From whom the whole body, that's me and you, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. See, when we understand what the church is, when we understand why we must commit to this body of Christ, then that's when we really start to get it. That's when we really start to understand the important role that each of us plays in the church. Paul says the entire church is necessary because the entire church is held together by each other, right? He describes us as joints and ligaments and, and right, he's, he's really getting into this, this metaphor of a human body, right? He's saying, no, we really do need each other because we're all connected. We are spiritually connected and united by the blood of Christ. And so Paul says each person then, when we're fully committed, when we're really in this, When we're saying, you know what, I want to love Jesus with all my heart and I want to love my church neighbor as myself, right? When we say that we're fully committed, when we really go all in, Paul says, guess what happens? The body starts working properly. The body grows. The body builds itself up in love. He's describing good health. That's what he's describing. He's describing a healthy body. Now think of all the things you do, right? To keep your physical body healthy, right? Or let me say it this way. Think of all the things we should be doing. (laughs) I think a lot about the things that I should be doing to keep my physical body healthy, right? But just as we should be committed to the physical health of our own bodies, we should be committed to the spiritual health of 
Christ's body, the church. So how do you do that? How do you really commit to the health of your church? Well, I think, first of all, we have to commit for the long haul. you got to make a commitment of future love, not just present love, but future love. Tim and Kathy Keller in their book on marriage, The Meaning of Marriage, just really, I, I thought that this stood out to me so, so much. They talk about how, you know, so you know when you're standing, uh, or if you're at a wedding, and you're attending a wedding, and, and the bride and the groom are standing there before the minister, and, and they're reciting vows to one another, and in that moment, in that moment, we know they love each other now, right? Well, that much is obvious, Right? They're head over heels for each other. That's why they're getting married. So when you're reciting your vows to your spouse in the moment, we're really not questioning your love now. So the vows aren't even really about the present, are they? Your marriage vows are really about the future. They're a promise of future love. They're a commitment to stand beside your spouse through the ups and the downs, through the turmoil, through the heartache, through the loss, through the tragedies that life inevitably brings to all of us in different seasons. It's a covenant that you're making before God, your spouse, and society. It's a covenant It's a commitment saying, you know what? I promise to love you in the future. You know I love you now. But I promise to love you in the future, even when I don't feel like it. Even when the feelings may not even be there completely, but I commit to loving you, as most of us say, till death do us part. You know, it's really the... it's. it's, (laughs) It's just really the kind of the same thing with the local church. You may say, oh, it's, is it really that serious? It is. You're committing. When you join a local church, when you commit to a local church, you know what you're really committing to? Future love. Future love, even when you may not feel like it. You're committing to be here. You're committing to be faithful to God first. It's a package deal. God and his people, through all the ups and downs, even when you don't feel like it, for a long time. And look, I know, there are obviously going to be good reasons why you can't stay at the same church for a long time. Of course, the number one reason is, you know, you move, right? So you move to another city, you move out of state. Maybe even in a city the size of Jacksonville, you move to the other side of the city, right? And this is just an hour-long drive. We get it, right? So we live in a very transient society these days. People are moving around much more than in years past, and that's understandable. I I myself, I've lived in four different states over my lifetime. For the record, though, I definitely want to stay in Florida because I hate the cold weather. I am good here, all right? And I'm sure a lot of churches up north, you know, probably lose church members when they retire, right? Because everybody wants to retire and move to Florida, But guess what? We don't have to worry about that. Y'all are already here, right? You're already here. And don't even think about going further south to the villages, okay? You don't need that. (laughs) You don't need that. Jacksonville is good for you, okay? But listen, even if you've moved around a lot, right? Even if you've moved around a lot, still, wherever you get to wherever you're moving, find a church. I should be on the top of the priority list. Find a church, get involved. Commit for the long haul, as long as you can. How about this? Commit to self-sacrifice. Commit commit to self-sacrifice. You're committing to love other people in the church. How? In what way? What, What form does that take? As Christ has loved you. Look at what he said. It's easy to read over this and not catch this in John 13, 34. Jesus said, I'm reading it again, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another. How? (laughs) He tells us how, and boy, is this weighty, just as I have loved you. How does Jesus love us? Right? With self-sacrifice. Not a selfish bone in his body. 
He is loving us with self-sacrifice, giving all of himself for the good of the other. And Jesus tells us that's how we should love each other. That's remarkable. How often, how often do we, not just church, but any, any aspect of your life, any arena, your marriage, your parenting, your friendship, your workplace, your school, right? How often do we walk into these places thinking, truly, really thinking, how can I be of good to someone else here today? It's just not natural, right? It's not natural for us to think that way in our selfish, ingrained mindset, but in Christ, you see it? Do you see it? The more you focus on what you've been given, the easier it is to give the same. The more you stop and you meditate on the truth of the grace and the mercy of Christ that you have been given, how much he has loved you, all of a sudden the easier it is to just loosen your grip on the things you think you need and you give them away to others. You give your time, you give your resources, you give your energy, you give your mental and emotional energy to others. Christ gave it all for us. He gave his life for you. He did what you could never do. He did what so many of us try to prove. Oh, I can be it. I can do it. I can, I can save myself. I can prove to God that I'm worthy. But we can't. It's amazing how much we try to sacrifice to prove to ourselves and to others and maybe to God how good we are when in reality we'll never measure up. But Christ's in true sacrifice, in true love, gave it all up and stood in your place. When you put your faith in him, his record of goodness becomes yours. <laughs> That's what salvation is. Salvation is not you trying to prove to God how good you can be. It's saying, I know how good Jesus has already been. It's putting your faith completely in him and his record becomes yours. You stand clean. You stand clean before God. That is the self-sacrificial love of Christ for you. And Jesus says, now go and love others like that. Wow. Is this really possible? And is this kind of commitment to the church, committing, long, committing to the long haul, right, over a long span of time, just planting yourself, planting yourself in the one church, as long as you live locally, right, geographically, if you live close, just committing there and saying, you know what, I'm going to grow with these people, I'm going to cry with these people, I'm going to laugh with these people, and I'm going to love these people, because that is exactly how Christ has loved me. How could I not? How could I not? How could I hold back that love for his body, for his bride, for his people? You know, many of you are newer to Kernan, and so you may not realize this, but this church campus uh, known as Kernan Boulevard Baptist Church opened in 1999. But before that, this church existed in a different location by a different geographical name. It was called Southside Estates Baptist Church, and it was located uh, several miles west of here on Beach Boulevard. So technically, Kernan Church, as we know it today, uh, has only existed since 1999, but this congregation actually dates back to 1948, when Southside Estates was founded. So when this campus was built here on this property in 99, of course, a lot of the physical items were moved over from, <clears throat> from the old building. And, and, you know, over the years, some of these things are stored away in, in closets and filing cabinets. And so uh, I don't know if you've ever cleaned out a church closet before, but it's, it's really like opening a time capsule. It's pretty fascinating. Uh, it can be very interesting and very weird. Um, at my last church, me and my wife, Christy, were doing this. We were cl cleaning out uh, a church <laughs> closet, and I just happened to come across a Tina Turner workout video on VHS, you know. <laughs> I didn't ask any questions. I didn't ask any questions, right? <laughs> so <laughs> trust me, there's a lot more examples. I don't even feel like I can share most of them with you right now, but you'll definitely find some funny stuff. But occasionally, occasionally, you'll also find some really, really cool stuff. So a few months ago, uh, we stumbled across something I think is very special. So this is a church directory of this congregation known as Southside Estates Baptist Church from 1968. 
Whoa, right? 1968. Yes, it is all, it's all in black and white, if you're, if you're wondering. And as I was turning through, I actually found a notebook version of this first. And as I was turning through this notebook, this directory from 1968, I found a picture of some people I thought looked familiar. I looked at their names. This is Mr. Bobby and Miss Janice Lee. And well, hang on, hang on, wait. Oh, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait. At this church in 1968. Today, they're sitting right here. You could clap now, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Bobby and Miss Janice met at this church at a Christmas party and were married in 1962. Miss Janice joined in 63. Mr. Bobby, Mr. Bobby was actually saved at this church, get this, in 1954. So this December makes 70 years that Mr. Bobby has been, yeah. And they would end up teaching Sunday school here for over 40 years. And I just want to say, I hope I'm like you guys. If the Lord lets me live that long, Christy and I, I hope that one day we can look back and say, you know what, we committed our lives to something. We committed our lives to something that was worth committing to. And I want to acknowledge that there are several others of you still here at this church who've been faithful for decades, and I know that. I know that. I just want you to know this is the picture I came across first, and I just thought it would be very special to show that to you all today. The point is this. I think Mr. Bobby and Miss Janice have modeled for us 1 Corinthians 12. They've embodied that truth that they've modeled for us what long-term commitment to a church might actually look like, that it is, it is possible. That you can go through the ups and downs, that you will see other people come and you will see other people go. You will see pastors come and go. You will see cultural movements in the world around you come and go. You will be there in the good times and you will be there in the bad times, but they made a commitment of future love and my goodness, they're still in that commitment today. So what about you? What's the next step for you? What's the next step in furthering your commitment to God's people? This is not about us. This is about Jesus. This is not a man-made organization. No, we are the living body of Christ. So what about you? What's your next step to commit to God and his people? So maybe it's baptism. Well, you saw it today, right? What a beautiful first step to give your life to Christ. Say, Lord, I surrender to you. And I want to commit myself to you for the rest of my life. Maybe it's getting involved with a community group, right? We have groups here of all ages for you to meet people in the same season of life as you, to learn together, to serve together, to just do life together. Maybe it's actually becoming a member here, right? We'll have our Discover Kernan class in April, April 7th, 14th, 21st, just a simple three-week class on Sunday mornings before the service. It's just a way for you to learn about the church and say, you know what, I, I think I do. I think I want to commit to this. Maybe serving in the church, right? Maybe you're already a member here and, and you say, you know what, I, I do think I need to... I have more to give. I want to give of myself as Christ gave to me. And so I want to serve. I want to be involved. I want to help others grow in their faith. So I just, on a practical note, listen, hey, if, you, if you'd like more information about any of these opportunities, you can talk to our Next Steps team. They're out in the lobby after the service every Sunday, ready to talk with you about salvation, baptism, serving in the church, how you can be involved information about community groups, these types of things. You can 
Email the church, of course, there's different ways to contact us. But what's your next step? Have you committed to future love of loving Christ and his body, his people, his family, his church? Would you bow your heads with me? I want us to pray and and just be honest with the Lord about where we stand. So for some of you, like I said, maybe committing your life to Christ is the first step. Maybe that's where you need to focus right now is, Lord, have I really committed myself to you? For some of you, it's going to be committing to this church. And you may think, well, I don't really know many people here and I I kind of feel like a stranger. Listen, that's okay. Guess what? We were all in the same boat at one time. We get it. We totally get it. We're not trying to make you feel weird or awkward or anything like that, and we won't. But don't be afraid to open up your life to other people. Nobody here is perfect, I promise you that. Don't be afraid to open up your heart and your life to other people and just get to know other Christians, to have that community that you need. Maybe for some of you it's serving. You know, I don't even know what I could do. I don't even know what I should do. I don't know what y'all need. What are the needs in the church? Well, listen, just step out and ask. Just ask one of our Next Steps team members today. Just say, hey, how can I help? Ask one of our staff members. Ask one of our ministry leaders. Give them a call. Give them a text. Send them an email. Just, hey, how can I help? I just want to help. I don't even know what I can do. Just tell me what I can do. I want to help. How can we build up the body in love?